Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to day two. My name is Chris Phelps. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, and I'm going to talk today about type parameters and variants. So why this talk? Uh, my company, Tendril, we're in smart energy. Uh, we do things uh, about understanding how people use energy in their home and trying to help them automate that. Uh, sorry, optimize that. And uh, one of the main products that we use for doing that is a home energy report. We're building a new system to build our home energy reports. Uh, it was based on a free monad kind of pattern, which I'm not going to describe, but uh, suffice to say, you end up with workflow stages that are all extensions of uh, a common base class. Uh, they're parameterized with whatever type of report uh, that you have, uh, in our case. Uh, we had many different reports, so we have different uh, reports that extend a base class, so now we've got workflow stages with different reports. Uh, there's single reports, optional reports, list of reports, so lots and lots of nested uh, type parameters. And the Scala compiler is usually pretty good at helping us uh, through this. We uh, sometimes, though, end up with some of these interesting kind of cases where we try to uh, uh, swap this A wrapper and the compiler tries to be helpful and tells us covariant type A occurs in contravariant position. Uh, and my engineers were quite confused, came to me and asked, you know, what, what the heck does this mean? Uh, and at first I couldn't give a, a, a good, succinct answer. Um, so once I was able to give them a good, succinct answer, uh, this was a good idea for a, a talk to propose. So the motivations for this talk, um, for users uh, of APIs, uh, you want to be able to understand signatures when you look at Scala docs and, and so on. Uh, you want to understand what does that API accept, so what can I pass to it? Uh, how do I make it interact with the stuff that I've got in my code base? Uh, and how do I make sense of uh, all those kinds of weird error messages? Uh, and as an API designer, you want to think about what you're going to allow your users to, to pass to you. Uh, what sort of flexibility do you want to offer to them? Uh, and occasionally you too run into these weird error messages and need to make sense of them. So Adrian Moores is on record uh, saying just add plus minus till it compiles. He will probably say that again this afternoon in his talk. Uh, and his point here is that the Scala compiler has your back. Uh, it does a lot to make sure that things are working right. And most of the time, this is just fine. Uh, but I think it's useful to understand uh, the deeper parts of your languages and your tools. Um, but don't, don't worry if you don't get this at first uh, or you don't understand all of it. The compiler does have your back and most of the time just adding plus minus till it compiles is, is okay to, to make things work. So the overall structure, I'm going to talk about variance first. Uh, we'll move from there into constraints. We'll see how constraints then get us to type classes. Uh, and then at the end we'll discuss really briefly how these things change in Dottie and Scala 3. So let's get started with variants, and we'll start uh, from the basics. So inheritance and substitution uh, through inheritance. So as we know, in Scala, all values have a type. Types have superclass relationships uh, that go up to a top class any. They also have a subtype relationship that go down to a bottom type nothing. And a reference can store uh, a reference with a given type can store instances of that type or instances of subclasses of that type. Functions can be passed instances of the type they expect or subclasses of the type they expect. And functions can return supertypes of the type it expects. If I tell you uh, I'm going to return you um, uh, uh, an, in, uh, an int, I can return you an any val. Am I saying that right? I don't think I am. but. Uh, sorry, I'm totally saying that wrong. Functions return subclass instances. So if a function tells you that it can return an any val, it can really return you an int because an int can still be treated as an any val. So uh, Liskov and Wing in 1994 formalized this uh, with the Liskov substitution principle. Uh, let phi of x be a property provable, blah, blah, blah. Um, Easy to understand if you think about it a lot, but not so much on the first read. Uh, so maybe Wikipedia's description is a little bit easier. If S is a subtype of T, then objects of T may be replaced with objects of S without altering the desirable properties of the program. OK. 
Okay, so we can put subclasses where we expect the superclasses without uh, altering the properties of the program. So let's talk about higher kinded types. Uh, these are also sometimes called generic classes. You can think of them as types that have a parameter. And so they usually contain or they're implemented in terms of some other type. So we've got things like list of int, more generally list of t. Uh, also more generally we could do uh, existentials in their list of, of anything. And so what this gives us is two different axes of subclassing. Uh, so we have the superclass subclass relationship of that container, but then we've also got the subclass superclass relationship of the parameter of the thing that's, that's inside of there. And this is where, where we're going to get to variance. We need to understand when are we concerned about the superclass subclass relationship of the container, when are we concerned about the subclass superclass relationship of the contents. So uh, the tour of Scala that you'll find on Scala.org says variance is the correlation of subtyping relationships of complex types and the subtyping relationships of their component types. So complex types means the containers and component types means the contents. And Twitter Scala School, which I've been told is, is pretty out of date uh, and not used within Twitter anymore, uh, but, but I think this, this still applies and is a good way of, of describing this. A central question that comes up when mixing OO with polymorphism, if U is a subclass of T, is container U considered a subclass of container T? But, uh, but I think this thinking about subclass and superclass uh, is, is an extra layer of, of thing to think about here. And what you're really interested in is when can I substitute things in two other places? So we can look at these definitions instead. Variance is the correlation of when we can substitute complex types and when we can substitute their component types. And the, the Twitter version applied a question that comes up, if U is a subclass of T, can a container of U's be substituted in where you expect a container of T's? So think about this like substituting in different machines. Right, Hobbs wants a machine uh, that he can push to do a thing, uh, and he doesn't care if Calvin suddenly gives him a new and improved duplicator that only makes uh, good Calvins, or that makes some noise other than boink uh, when he pushes the button. So when can we substitute which kinds of machines? Uh, a lot of the documentation, blog posts, etc., you're going to see are going to use pets and animals and things like that in their examples. I don't think this is a particularly compelling thing, but it's very naturally, uh, uh, very natural to understand. Um, so I'm going to continue to use that pattern. That way you don't have to, to remember anything about my special domain that I'm going to use. Uh, so we've got an animal base class. Pets are types of animals. Cats and dogs are types of pets. Uh, a little class diagram looks something like that. So let's start with the different types of variants. So the default case is invariance, and this means there's no subclass relationship, which means that we can't substitute any containers of T with containers of U unless U and T are the same type. So uh, anything that's a var has to be invariant. And this seems not so interesting or not so useful at first glance, but actually there's, a, there's more deeper uh, usage of this because this influences type inference. Uh, so this will allow uh, the compiler to bind types uh, that, that it doesn't know uh, because it can't be anything but uh, the, the t-type that, uh, that it, it understands in some context. So examples of that. So here I've got an invariant wrapper. We mark that it's invariant because we have no sort of plus minus uh, annotation on the A. Uh, in this case, we've just got a wrapped value that gets stored and there's a def to pull it back out. So I can then have an instance of that with, uh, with a particular type. So an invariant wrapper uh, of cat uh, with, a, with Morris the cat stored in it. So now we've got one axis of inheritance, which is our uh, container subclass and superclass. So if I make a sub wrapper that extends invariant wrapper, I'm still in the same A's. Uh, so when I uh, create a sub wrapper with Milo in it, I can still put it inside my invariant wrapper val. 
But if I have an invariant wrapper of some animal, I cannot put an invariant wrapper of some subclass of animal cat into there. So I can't put uh, Bill's, uh, an invariant wrapper of Bill, uh, sorry, containing Bill into an invariant wrapper of animal. I could only put that into an invariant wrapper of cat. And if I try to do that last line, then I'm going to see an error something like this. Uh, expected uh, invariant wrapper of animal, uh, found an invariant wrapper of cat. In this case, the compiler is pretty helpful. Uh, note, example, uh, cat is a subtype of animal, but class invariant wrapper is invariant in A. Okay, that's, that's useful. So covariance is the first of the other two that we'll talk about. So this has a subclass relationship when the contents have a subclass relationship. So if U is a subclass of T, then we can substitute containers of U where we expect containers of T. So this is useful for extracting contents of the container uh, because instances of U can be used wherever instances of T's are. Uh, so whenever I have a container of U, uh, it will produce T instances because U's are T's. And so all my types are sound. Uh, I can still use that container of U anywhere I expected a container of T, take things out of it, and they're still going to be T's. But this is problematic when uh, adding or changing values, and uh, we'll see that in a few slides. So an example of that, uh, covariant wrapper uh, plus A means it's covariant in A. Uh, again, I have the same, uh, just uh, it contains a wrapped and has a def to get it back out. Uh, if I have some do it method uh, that now expects a covariant wrapper of animal, I can pass in covariant wrappers of cats, I can pass in covariant wrappers of dogs. Do it can get the thing out as an animal and do something with it. Because, again, cats and dogs are both pets, which are both animals. But if I try to take a covariant wrapper of any, uh, pass it a covariant wrapper of any uh, with a cat in it, um, then it will tell me I, I found a covariant wrapper of any, but I expected a covariant wrapper of animal. So animal goes up to any, but any, does, any is uh, uh, a super type of animal. So contravariance goes the opposite way. This is where it starts to get confusing. Subclass relationship when contents have a superclass relationship. Uh, but think about that again in terms of substitution. I can substitute a container of U uh, into a place where I expect a container of T if U's are going to give me something above T's. And why would we do this? This is useful for when we have processors or consumers of the values. So I can use a U anywhere where I expect a T. So if I have something that can process a T, it can also process a U, uh, only looking at the, the T parts of the U. So, so that consumer of, of and I think I'm, I'm saying this in a different order than my slide is saying it. So uh, instances of U can be used where instances of T's are expected. Uh, so a consumer of, uh, this should say consumer of T can consume U instances. So the types are sound. When I pass this to the consumer, uh, he can still get my things out even though they're subtypes and, and deal with them. Uh, but in this case, it's problematic when we return or produce values. So, so here uh, we, have, we have a keeper uh, uh, who keeps pets. Uh, we're contravariant in A, so that's the minus A annotation. A dog sitter is a keeper of dogs. A uh, zookeeper is a keeper of all animals, and a pet sitter is a keeper of pets. Uh, I've got this tend method uh, that, uh, for dog sitter uh, that takes a dog, uh, does something, returns a unit. Um, so all those uh, FP purists would be unhappy with me. Um, you, can, you can imagine that the same tend uh, exists in, in all of these uh, with the appropriate types. I just uh, eliminated them from the slide. So, uh, so I have a keeper of dog uh, who's going to dog sit for a dog tin tin. Uh, I have a uh, keeper of dogs uh, and I can replace him with a zookeeper. 
because zookeepers can keep any animal, so they can also keep dogs. So that's, that's easy, that works. If on the other hand I have a keeper of pets, and I replace it with a, keep, with a dog sitter, dog sitters are just keepers of dogs, they're not keepers of all types of pets. Uh, so I'm gonna have a problem there, uh, and the compiler will tell me I found a dog sitter, I required a keeper of example.pet. And incidentally, if I hadn't uh, uh, hidden the parameterization away in the dog sitter, uh, this would have said like uh, found keeper of dog expected required a keeper of pet. So this gets us a little closer back to uh, Jackie's problem. Uh, we've got covariant positions, contravariant positions, and variant positions. What does positions mean? So there's, there's a whole sequence in the, uh, the Scala language spec that talks about positions and how they change as you pass things uh, from one to another, as you nest functions in one to another. Uh, but you can start simply by thinking covariant position is method returns, uh, contravariant position is method arguments, uh, and invariant positions are mutable uh, exposed variables. So anything that's contravariant as marked in the annotations can't appear in the contravariant position, so can't appear in a method argument. Anything that's marked contravariant in the method args can appear in a covariant position, so can't appear in a return. And neither covariant or contravariant parameters appear in invariant positions, so uh, you can't have your plus a show up as a var. Uh, Scala 2.12.6 and IntelliJ give a little bit different error messages on these that, that are not as clear in the invariant case. They still end up saying can appear in contravariant position or something like that. So what's the problem with that? Why is this even a thing? So, so now I have a box of pets and that box can hold uh, any, any subtype of pet, so I wanna be able to uh, give you a box of cats if you ask for a box of pets. Um, it has a swap method, and that swap method wants to take the pet that's inside and put another pet inside. Uh, so that's what I wanna do, but I'm gonna end up with, with this error, um, contravariant uh, pet plus pet uh, occurs in contra uh, covariant pet plus pet appears in contravariant position uh, in the method argument. So why is that a problem? So let's imagine now I've got a box of cats uh, that's got um, Morris the cat in it, and I swap that with another cat. Okay, no problem, it's, it's a box of cats, it can still hold a cat. But not every cat, or, or, or cats aren't the only kinds of pets, right? So you thought you had a box of pets, uh, you try to put Caesar the dog into that box of pets. Uh, now we've got problems because my box of cats uh, can't hold a box of pets. So that's why um, contravariant positions is a problem. Now what about the other side, covariant positions? So here we've got a, a, a pet sitter. Uh, a, something that is a sitter, so this is co uh, a contravariant pet because a sitter of uh, um, a sitter of pets can sit any pet. A sitter of cats can only sit cats. Uh, so a cat sitter um, could be replaced by uh, a pet sitter. So that pet sitter is still perfectly capable of, of uh, keeping my cat Doraemon, which is tough. He's, he's a hard cat to keep, keep track of. Um, and uh, the sitter now has this walk method that's going to do something with that pet and return, return a, new, a new state of pet. So if I now have my cat sitter and I send him off to walk Doraemon, okay, everything seems okay. Um, but now the problem is if I have a sitter of pet, we've only said that that sitter of pet is going to return new pets. So, um, so I've got this sitter of cats, uh, I've stored this sitter of pets in it, uh, now what happens if it returns a cat? No problem, I've got a sitter of cats, I expect cats, is all, it's all good. If I have a, a sitter that returns a different kind of pet, I expected a cat, it's not a cat. Now we've got a problem. So this is why uh, contravari uh, covariant positions are problems with contravariant parameters. So let's move on and talk about functions and uh, their types. 
and see how this kind of expands out into a few more parameters than that. So uh, again, remember we're thinking about what can substitute in where. So I have a pet, a val p1 is a pet, a val p2 is a pet. And I'm going to call some function f with two pets. So what are the signatures that f could take? What, what would make this valid? So if f took two pets and I pass it two pets, is that a valid signature for f? Sure. If f takes an animal and a pet and I pass it two pets, is that a valid signature for f? Sure. If uh, f takes an any and a pet, is that a valid signature for f? Yeah. If it takes any any, if it takes cats and dogs, uh, sorry, if it takes any any, that's, that's still valid, right? We can still pass that two pets. Uh, but if, it takes, if f takes a cat and a dog and I pass it two pets, that's, that's problematic. So that's not a signature that f could take. So what does this relationship look like? That looks like uh, contravariance. So our function parameters are contravariant. And what about the outputs? So if I have an f and I pass it two pets and it gives me back an animal, I expect an animal back. What are the valid uh, signatures that, that f could have? So if f took two pets and returned an animal, yeah, that's valid. That's, that's what I expect out. If f took two pets and returned a pet, yeah, that would be a valid signature of an f that I could call. If it took two pets and returned a cat, Cats are still pets, so yeah, that's still a valid signature I could call. If it took two pets and returned an any, now that's not going to be a valid signature for the thing that I'm trying to call for uh, P1 and P2 and get back an any. So that looks like covariance. So our function returns are covariant. Uh, our function returns are covariant. Uh, and this function two definition is exactly what we see in Scholadoc. Uh, this is true for all of the, uh, the 22, 23 variants of function. They are contravariant in arguments and covariant in returns. So when do you want to use which of these? So covariants, these are really good for containers whenever, or producers, whenever we want to get the thing out. And so, therefore, it's really good for representing inputs. Uh, as, a, as a consumer of the thing, I'm going to take whatever that input is and use it. So our function one is going to do something with those, uh, expects that it knows they are subtypes of, uh, of that type I'm expecting. Contravariance, on the other hand, is good for consumers, processors, visitors, things like that. Things where uh, I want to be able to do some sort of processing and it's okay that I only process parts of the sub thing, right? So uh, something that uh, consumes pets, um, yeah, uh, sits pets, uh, can sit any sort of subtype of pet. And so it's really good for representing outputs, right? Anything that, um, here's a thing that I am going to give to some follow-on processing. And in variance, uh, as we said, it's a little more interesting than it looks on first blush. Uh, this is good for representing distinct types. So it's really good for markers and labels kind of types. Uh, Dick Wall yesterday uh, in his talk showed how he used uh, the, uh, how he used invariance to give marker types so that he could keep coordinate systems together with uh, coordinates in that system uh, and because there's no relationship between the different uh, types of uh, coordinate systems, uh, he can mark that and know that he's got coordinates in the wrong system whenever he tries to process them. And these are useful because then they influence the inheritance, uh, uh, sorry, influence the inference uh, algorithm. So I kind of glossed over what we do when we get to Jackie's problem, right? What do we, how do we, how do we get out of that situation? Um, so that'll lead us into constraints. So we have, the first type of constraint we have is an upper or lower bound. Uh, so we're going to use the less colon or the greater colon 
uh, to indicate that there is some relationship between RP and uh, another type. Uh, so an upper bound says that P is the same type or a subtype to whatever's on the other side of that. So uh, a pet of P, which is a subtype of pet, uh, could be a pet, could be a cat, could be a dog. And lower bounds say that uh, it's the same type or a supertype. Uh, so B is either the same as A or it is some supertype of A. So how does that in interact with variance? So I've got a covariant list. Uh, it has, it's an abstract class. It's got two extensions, a case object nil, uh, which extends list of nothing, and a case class cons, uh, which is of hazard B. Uh, this is essentially what these look like in the uh, 212 collections. Um, there's a little bit of simplification here, but not much. Uh, it's slightly simplified a tiny bit differently uh, for the 213 ones. And so now if I want to um, add a prepend method to that list, okay, think cons. This gets us right back into the problem that we saw before, right? So, um, so I'm trying to pass as a method argument, so uh, contravariant position, uh, a covariant A. And so I get Jackie's, Jackie's error. So what could I do about this? Well, maybe I could introduce a different type B. And we'll say that prepend uh, is parameterized in B. You tell me when you call it uh, what that B is, uh, and we'll make a new list of Bs. But the problem here is now there's no relationship between A and B. So the compiler says, I don't know what to do with your existing list, this, uh, and, and how to turn those A's into B's. We need some sort of relationship between the two. And so that's a place where we can start to now introduce uh, a, a bound. So we can say that B has to be the same type or a supertype. And now we're going to take a new B, so the same type or a supertype, and we're going to return a list of the new supertype. And so what this is doing is changing from the same type to potentially a wider type. And this is exactly how things work. So uh, if I have a list of ints here uh, and I try to put a zero onto the front of it, uh, int is still the same type, so I get a new list of ints. All the existing things are ints. Yay, we're happy. Uh, if I try to put 1.5 in, uh, 1.5 is not an int. Uh, so we're going to find, the compiler is going to find the lowest upper bound uh, and widen that list so it's now going to become a list of any vowels. All those ints are still any vowels, the new thing's still in any vowel, so we end up with a wider list. But the problem now is when we try to get things out of it, we've lost that some of those are ints and some of those are doubles. We've just got there any vowels and everything we take out is in any vowel. And if we want to do better than that, we would have to do icky uh, um, type casting and things like that. We don't like those things. So view bounds, about all I want to say about them is they're deprecated. They are still in the spec. Uh, you may see them in some code, but I don't think they show up anywhere in the community build. Um, and they basically just say A is convertible to B by some process. But context bounds now start to get interesting. Context bounds says that A has some context, uh, which means that there exists uh, some type context of A uh, somewhere in implicit scope. The compiler can find uh, an instance of context for A. And so what this does then is introduces an evidence parameter. Uh, so our method would look something like uh, CTX bound of X, which has the content context M, takes an X. And the compiler is going to take that colon M and add this implicit evidence parameter that's going to find that instance in implicit scope and, uh, and supply it to me. And maybe that's good enough. Maybe I don't need to do anything with, uh, with that evidence uh, once it exists. Uh, this is a case of um, 
one of the things that Martin mentioned the other day uh, about erasing uh, at um, code generation time. Uh, but if I wanted to, I could access the context uh, with the implicitly keyword uh, from my code. So I could fetch it uh, by saying implicitly m of x and then call some method on it. So what's that useful for? Well, that, that gets us to the type class pattern as, as it exists in Scala. So type classes are some external implementation of an interface. Uh, so you can implement an interface without needing to go alter the existing source code. Uh, you don't necessarily even have to have access to the source code. You find some new interface that you want to implement and you implement a context uh, that implements that interface for your type. And you can introduce that into places that want to uh, consume them uh, with a content bound, context bound. And this is really useful because then we can implement instances in terms of other instances and the compiler will give us the ones that we need. Uh, so if we have adders for ints, uh, we can make an adder for pair of ints relying on the adder of ints that's given to us by the compiler. And that becomes really powerful because we don't even have to know what that T type is. I can make an adder of pairs of T's as long as the compiler can supply me an adder of T's. And the compiler figures out what it is. So I don't need to know all the possibilities that T could be in somebody else's program. So the mechanics of this. We define some interface, or maybe they exist in CATS or Scala-Z or you know, some other library. We implement an instance of that for our class. We put that somewhere in implicit scope so that the compiler can find it either as a type constraint or explicitly writing our evidence parameter ourselves. We pass it to the function that we want to we wanna use uh, that thing from. And we can call methods on that interface. So here's an adder for a's. Uh, I make an int adder for ints. Okay, so I have an adder for a's and it's going to add two a's and return an a. And so I can make an instance of that for ints that's going to add two ints and return an int uh, just by delegating to regular uh, plus. I'm going to put it in implicit scope as a val. So then in some other place uh, where I want to add things together, I can say I want to add any t which has an adder context. Compiler will supply that adder of t when I call this with ints, uh, with the adder for ints. Uh, I can summon it with implicitly keyword and then call add method on it. So cool. Now if I have uh, a pair, uh, pair case class has got two t's and I want to make a, an adder for pairs, uh, I want to say now that this is an adder for pairs of things which have adders. Okay. So uh, the way I'm going to implement that is I'm going to uh, grab the adder of t's that the compiler has supplied to me. I'm going to delegate that to add the first two things together, add the second two things together, return the pair of the two things. And I don't need to have known what this t was. This could have been an adder of ints, an adder of pair, uh, uh, of, um, of, of doubles, an adder of lists, an adder of some crazy domain type that you have uh, where add means who the heck knows in your domain. And now I can add pairs of those things together uh, by delegating to the, the adder for that t. So let's, uh, let's talk briefly about what's going to change with this in uh, Dottie and Scala 3. Um, short answer here is little or none. So Martin said, uh, and I'm not sure if he used quite these words, he used these words in, in Berlin, Scala 3 is fundamentally the same language as Scala 2. So uh, variants and type bounds still exist. Uh, they're essentially the same. Everything that you just learned about covariance, contravariance, and invariance is going to be the same. Uh, everything that we just saw about upper bounds, lower bounds, and context bounds are going to be the same. Um, the current version of dot, e, of dot C gives slightly different error messages to these. We may see the error messages continue to evolve uh, as those come closer to Scala 3. 
uh, existential types go away, but uh, there will be uh, other uh, type lambda stuff um, to get that same kind of thing. So, um, structural types, which I didn't really talk about, but that's uh, essentially uh, duck typing sort of thing. You say, give me anything that has this method or that has this, this shape. Uh, they're still going to exist. The implementation details are going to be different. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how usage of those evolves. Uh, because in the 2.12s, uh, sorry, in, in the 2x line, uh, those are implemented with runtime uh, in a, uh, runtime introspection. Um, so they incur definitely a performance uh, hit. And so they haven't been used too extensively. Uh, but we'll see with, uh, with type lambdas and so on if those are, are become more useful. So a couple of things I'd like you to take away from this. So remember when you're coming to variants, you're reading anything about variants, they're going to talk about subtyping and supertyping, but think about it in terms of substitution. When can I substitute a thing uh, into some other place? It's really important that this isn't just a concept that somebody made up, that Martin made up, or that uh, 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 somebody made up in the Java space or anything. This arises naturally. You know, I showed how Liskov substitution tells us when we can substitute a thing for another thing, and that led us to places where it was natural to uh, pass in a, a subtype or pass in a supertype. And I think this is part of the reason that people get uh, mixed up with this when they run into Jackie's problem. They're trying to do something that seems really natural, that seems uh, intuitive to them, and they don't understand why I had to mark this as covariant in order for this to, to work the way that my intuition says it should work. Um, so Scala has really given us the opportunity there to be really clear uh, in our intent, uh, even though in a lot of cases we expect it to work with a certain, a certain intuition. Scala expects us to tell us uh, that it's going to use that intuition. And so this, this concept is really deeply entwined with subclassing as, as, as a, a concept, right? As a, as a theoretical concept. So with bounds, we can use bounds to help us get around uh, some of our variance problems uh, by widening or narrowing. And bounds interact with implicits via context bounds and give rise to patterns like the type class pattern. So, so all these things are, are um, deep and useful uh, features that, that operate with one another in a, in a subtle way. Um, and they're much more, I think, than just esoterica. So you can find my Twitter. Uh, I will be posting these slides somewhere and we'll announce them on there. Uh, there are some examples uh, from this talk uh, in my GitHub uh, there.